Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I'm Alexei Gavrilenko, Chief Operating Officer here at Campspace. Uh, excited to be here, excited to be the host of the webinar. So before, just before we start, uh, I would like to remind several rules of the webinar. So basically, the first rule is uh, that you, as attendees, would be muted for the whole time of the webinar. But you have, nevertheless, you have the opportunity to ask your questions in the uh, chats or question box uh, down on the, on the bottom of the screen of the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, so you're very welcome to, to paste the question over there. And basically I will collect the question and after the webinar, uh, after, in the end of the webinar, after the presentation of our main speaker today, I will ask the questions. Uh, also, um, the webinar will be recorded and uh, we will share the link with you, with the attendees or the guys who didn't have a chance to join us today. Uh, and we will download it to our YouTube channel. So in any, uh, in, in the first convenience of, of, of your time uh, or colleagues of yours, you can uh, go over there and basically enjoy the presentation. Uh, also, I encourage you, all the attendees, to subscribe to our social media in case not to um, uh, not to miss another cool webinar presentation. Because we uh, we do our best to uh, to 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 host top events. So please please be be with us and stay with us and stay connected with Camp Space. So uh, apart from that. Uh, uh, the, the webinar will be split into three sections. So the first section, part number one, will be my presentation about ChemSpace, what we do, what the news, what the new news are. Uh, the second section, and basically, I will uh, pass the word to our speaker, Adam. Uh, and uh, after that, that would be a Q and A section, uh, session. And yeah, so after that, uh, the webinar will be closed. And yeah, and so. Uh, Having mentioned all that, I will be sharing my screen, and I hope uh, I hope you can see it. Please confirm. Yeah, yeah. Adam, can you please confirm you you can see my screen and the and the. Yes, I can see that. Thanks. Yeah, yeah perfect. Yeah, so let's get started. Uh, so. A few words about Campspace. So Campspace was founded like in 2015 um, by uh, four major contributors, and uh, we are our main location and all of all of the team of ours is located here in Kiev, which I am right now. Uh, but uh, apart from that, we have two logistic hubs uh, on the, uh, on the globe uh, in the European Union in the Regulatory, and also we have the. Uh, guys in, in New Princeton, New Jersey, to facilitate uh, our uh, logistics within the, uh, within, within the Americas. And overall, we are constantly growing in, uh, in our teammates. So uh, uh, at the, for today, I can say that we have more than 60, uh, 60 teammates. Uh, so our main business activities, there are basically three of those. Uh, so we do perform the heat discovery services such as chem informatics, virtual legal screening, uh, Dell and machine learning. Also, we provide comprehensive solutions for procurement and sourcing of, compo of compounds, uh, of chemical compounds and biologics. And also, uh, we do provide uh, the compound management services such as liquid, liquid handling, policy control and storage of the, comp on the, of the purchased compounds. Uh, so, and also, apart from uh, our services, we do have our products, uh, and we combine those products into our catalog. And this catalog uh, comprises of five mo most uh, big parts, uh, such as uh, small molecules in terms of uh, bio building blocks, intermediates, reagents, uh, and screening compounds. And also, we have uh, two compounds and chemical probes. Um, and also, we provide uh, compound sets, which uh, uh, which consist of uh, pre-applied libraries, focus libraries, and fragments libraries. And for, uh, just to, uh, almost for two years from now, we launched the biologics products, and we have almost uh, half a million uh, of antibodies, proteins, and kits. 
So overall, Chemspace is the largest available marketplace on the market. Sorry, sorry for that. Uh, that has basically uh, chemistry and biology on one uh, website, on one platform. So, uh, and uh, from now for today, uh, we have almost 11.5 uh, billion small molecules that are, uh, that are online searchable uh, and basically uh, you can go online and uh, have it a substructure search, text search, or import your file to, to find molecules of your interest. And as I mentioned about the biologics, uh, we have those as well that uh, they're here and they're uh, basically available for purchasing. And uh, also, um, uh, apart from the in-stock and make and demand uh, compounds, we uh, just recently we have launched uh, like this combinations of two, uh, of two spaces uh, and uh, uh, that is provided by our my friends and partners from BioSolvet and the spaces are Inamin Real and uh, Chemspace Freedom Space. Uh, so it's uh, it has more more than five, uh, fifty billion compounds, and uh, that is uh, the synthetic visibility is great. It's over, uh, over seventy five percent, and the deliverability is uh, uh, is uh, provided for almost four to six weeks. So it is also available on chemspace.com and you can, uh, you can reg uh, and highly encourage you to register and uh, to, uh, to, uh, to give it a try to have uh, new molecules powered by, uh, by F3 similarity search uh, created by SolVT. Uh, also, uh, our catalog is, uh, could be integrated uh, into uh, to uh, has an ability to connect uh, with a punch uh, with your ERP system via punch out site, or we can create a standalone portal uh, with a, your uh, company name and basically all the camp space um, under, under under the hood. Uh, it is very it is very convenient uh, to have uh, such an integration because it simplifies the process with your ERP system and uh, all this. Uh, all these uh, 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 questions about uh, the purchase orders and uh, the tracking, we all do cover that. So basically, that's a camp space under, under, behind your uh, firewall. Uh, and uh, the information is all uh, secured and uh, uh, it, it is safe. And so basically, no one, uh, it, it, is, it is your portal. Uh, uh, behind, as I mentioned, your firewall. And uh, apart from our mm, catalog uh, uh, division, subdivision, we, uh, we provide the uh, services, uh, as I mentioned, the, the heat discovery, and also we, we do the sourcing and procurement of uh, chemical and biological compounds. And we do provide it from multiple vendors. And if you, you basically works like that, so you, you have a list of molecules of your interest, you come to us, and uh, we, it's our uh, job to basically uh, combine those compounds from different suppliers, uh, uh, reweigh it, uh, and uh, and to do everything that is uh, that is necessary, and eventually deliver it to you or the company you work with. Uh, and also, a uh, very important uh, part of our business is the uh, is the uh, the uh, discovery pro uh, projects that we we support and uh, this is uh, so we have a pretty uh, that, uh, that can cover great portfolio and uh, uh, starting from the target identification uh, having the heat identification and we can make this heat to lead optimization, including start catalog, custom spaces, uh, and, and such. And uh, eventually, we can uh, we can after the stage of the lead of optimization, we can ensure the uh, to to, uh, to 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 support the preclinical studies for your project. Um, so uh, it's it is very important for us to to have the service and to to. To fulfill your and to bring your research to a new level. Uh, so uh, 
just recently we have uh, the opportunity to to collaborate uh, with uh, with Arichat, and we're happy to we are happy to hold the webinar uh, with our partners and uh, friends. And uh, today, uh, I would like uh, would like to introduce you to Adam, uh, Dr. Adam Buckle, uh, Chief Scientific Officer at Arijet. And uh, a few words uh, on Adam. He holds a PhD in molecular genetics uh, from the University of Edinburgh and has a passion for technology and innovation. Uh, he's an experienced molecular uh, biologist uh, with uh, almost uh, more than 16 years of scientific experience uh, across a variety of research areas, uh, including genetics, uh, epigenetics, and transcriptional re re regulation. Uh, he joined uh, Arijet four years ago and uh, managed uh, uh, their CRO and CMO functions before becoming uh, Chief Scientific Officer uh, earlier this year. And today, uh, uh, please welcome this, uh, uh, the talk of Adam's talk on small molecule microarrays for drug discovery. So I will stop sharing my screen and uh, basically, Adam, the floor is yours. Thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure. Please. Thank you very much. Great. So We'll just get set up one second. Okay. Is that showing up okay? Yeah, perfect. Great. Well, uh, yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. So, yeah, um, as, as has already been said, I'm uh, Dr. Adam Buckle. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer at Arrayjet, and um, today I'm going to talk to you uh, about um, small molecule microarraying. So um, I'm going to start off by telling you a little bit about uh, Arrayjet as a company uh, and some of the services we offer. I'm then going to go into more detail about what a small molecule microarray is. I'll then cover some of the small molecule microarray process as an overview, some of the specific applications, and then I'll finish off with the small molecule microarray screening platform that Arrayjet uh, can offer. So um, Arrayjet is a uh, specialist biochemical printing company serving the life, si life sciences sector. Uh, and we've been making inkjet dispensing instrumentation since 2000. Uh, and we design, assemble, and test all our instruments uh, in Edinburgh in the UK. Uh, and we also offer uh, contract research and contract manufacturing services since 2011. We've got a newly expanded lab and clean room facility that opened in August this year and we hold an ISO uh, 013485 accreditation. So some more details about some of the services that we're able to offer. So as I've already said, you know, we, we design and build our instrumentation ourselves, um, and we have the fastest systems in the world for ultra low volume dispensing of all types of biological samples onto any substrate. Um, we have uh, contract research and manufacturing expertise through our Rayjet Advance services, and we run a wide range of projects from uh, proof of concepts, development projects, to screening applications. We also have uh, an excellent uh, group of engineers that travel the world. We have instruments all over the world for a variety of applications, and our uh, support team of engineers travel the world to upgrade and service this instrumentation. And then finally, we have a range of consumables and slides that complement our other services. Okay, so I'm going to sort of describe a little bit more about what a microarray is. I think some of you will be familiar with the terminology from uh, DNA microarrays. Essentially, a microarray is a glass slide or microplate spotted with many biological or chemical probes in a miniaturized 2D grid. So it's a miniaturized experiment. Um, samples of interest are incubated on the microarray surface and to detect specific interactions, often uh, through the use of fluorescent markers. And microarrays have had a long and established history. They started off being used for um, genotyping and DNA arrays, wide range of applications, including uh, high throughput screening, hit detection in drug discovery, and multiplex diagnostics. And uh, microarrays are often referred to as microchips. Um, for lab testing. So yeah, the main reason I'm talking today is to talk to you about um, small molecule microarraying, and this schematic sort of summarizes 
briefly what a small micro microarray is or SMM. So a small micro microarray is a biochemical microchip that's uh, for efficient hit discovery. And in this schematic here, tens of thousands of compounds are patterned onto a highly reactive surface. Uh, and then individual target molecules of interest in this schematic on the right, either proteins or RNA that are fluorescently tagged. These target molecules, molecules are then screened in parallel with the whole surface of the slide uh, for binding interactions. Then hits can be rapidly identified using fluorescence for further investigation. So I'm going to go into a bit more detail about the small microarray process using this schematic, and I'm going to use this schematic to ground the talk as I work through the different processes. So as an overview, I'm going to cover small molecule libraries, and then going to move on to the surface chemistry, which is particularly critical for small molecule microarray. I'm then going to cover the printing technology, which um, you know Arraja have developed ourselves, and then going to be talking about the expertise that we've built up around binding interactions, target types, and give you some case studies. And then I'm going to finish up by talking about validation. So I'm going to start off by talking about small molecule libraries. And actually, small molecule libraries is, is really the reason that I'm giving this talk today, because uh, Arraja is delighted to be able to partner with ChemSpace on sourcing and curating small molecules for this platform. And as uh, it's already been well covered, ChemSpace have you know, a large panel of ready to print, ready to screen compounds. Um, they also have sets of targeted and pathway focused panels and also can help with curating custom panels. So small molecule microarray is a very high throughput technique. Um, you know, we're talking in the thousands tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, there's really no upper limit on the number of small molecules that can be screened with this method, particularly we'd be talking about splitting the libraries down into sub libraries for the screening. We can also work um, in, in batches where we batch produce large amounts of these small molecule microarray chips that can then be used for screening of a variety of different targets. So the input is very streamlined. And again, this is why we're really pleased to work with ChemSpace as highlighted on the right here, from their general pre-plated um, panel. These compounds are ready to print. In essence, they're available in plates. They're already solubilized in DMSO, and they're ready to be loaded straight into our instrumentation. And this is because a Rayjet technology can print in 100% DMSO at standard stock concentrations, really streamlining the process of printing and hit discovery. It's also an ultra efficient technique. So we, um, when we aspirate sample from these plates, when we print small molecules, we typically aspirate less than one microliter of small molecules. And this can be used for screen, uh, producing up to 250 individual chips or experiments. And particularly when we're working with small molecules, the small molecule libraries, it needs to be very client led. You know, the library content is critical. And again, we can work with ChemSpace to curate the library to make it specific for your particular needs. OK, so I'm going to move on from um, the small molecule libraries to talk about surface chemistry. So surface chemistry is really critical to small molecule microarray and uh, particularly the isocyanate surface chemistry. So uh, coupling via surface isocyanate groups is attractive for um, small molecule microarray due to the high reactivity for binding of a broad range of nucleophilic chemical groups that are commonly found in small molecules. And this was really a lot of the work that was originally pioneered by the lab, the Kola lab, the Schneefloff lab at NCI. And these are the references highlighted here. And it was this breakthrough in the surface chemistry that really maximized the binding of small molecules to the surface that makes small molecule microarray such an important and viable technique. And we're really building on that work that has, you know, that has been done um, you know, over the past 20 years. So I'm just going to cover briefly the coupling process. Um, so we start off with an amine functionalized glass slide. We add a spacer, can vary the space, spacer length. We deprotect the end of that, and then we add on a diisocyanate. We now have the highly reactive um, isocyanate surface that's available for coupling to small molecules, and we print these small molecules onto this surface. So a regjet has been working with a chemistry partner to create an enhanced small molecule surface for our small molecule microarray process. There's no commercially available um, to date isocyanate surface. So we're really pleased to be able to offer our own freshly prepared, highly reactive isocyanate surface for our SMM platform. 
and it's really maximizing this reactivity that is really critical to getting good quality small molecule microarray data and that's why i'm going to talk about this a little bit more so as part of this um, development of the surface, we've been you know, running a number of uh, experiments to test the reactivity of this. And this is about replicating some of that original work that was done by in the Kohler lab and Schneefloff lab um, using the isocyanate surface. And really the aim of this experiment I just want to talk you through is to demonstrate the broad surface reactivity um, by printing a panel of biotin um, with a peg spacer and different nucleophilic residues on the isocyanate to represent those different types of small molecules that we want to capture on the surface. So in this method, it is essentially a small molecule microarray, but we're printing down biotin peg nucleophilic residues as 200 picoliter droplets in 100% DMSO onto our highly reactive isocyanate surface. This on the right here is the, um, is the different uh, compounds that we're printing down. We immobilize them to the surface and then we detect them with streptavidin. And you know, we know the um, we can have reasonably predictable behaviors of these different nucleophilic residues based on their nucleophilicity. And this is some of the data that we've generated, and this really shows that a rage isocyanate surface that we've optimized has broad surface reactivity for small molecule binding. <clears throat> so what I'm showing on the left here is a small molecule microarray. So this is compounds that have been printed down, these different nucleophilic residues on the end of the biotin, coupled to the surface, and then we're detecting them by incubating these orientated biotin molecules with um, streptavidin. And what we can see on the right is when we quantify that, we get, uh, as the, in this case, this is a, a, a relative quantica quantification to the biotin amine, we can see that we get different coupling efficiencies to the surface, again, very much in line with the predictions we would make about uh, nucleophilicity. And we can see that amines and the thiols and the hydrazides couple very well, but we've really been working on maximizing the binding for the carboxylic acids, alcohols, primary and secondary alcohols, and phenols. And this, again, is really critical to maximizing surface coupling. And if we were to um, you know, show a uh, immobilization data for a commercially available surface like epoxy, we would, wouldn't see this level of binding, particularly for the, um, the less reactive residues. But why am I telling you all this? Why is this important for small micro and micro ring? Well, it's, as I said, it's all about maximizing compound choice. Um, it's about maximizing library diversity and ultimately maximizing compound immobilization to the surface. And what this means for small molecule selection, when we work with chem spaces, we do need to do some filtering for nucleophilic residues um, within these small molecule libraries, but uh, maximizing the capacity to pick secondary alcohols and things like that really expands the, um, the, the utility of this technique. And actually when these, the first small molecule microarray papers were coming out, they, another term which was used was diversity arrays because some of the other methods um, before the isocyanate surface chemistry was um, about specific coupling of, of individual residues to the surface. But this is about broadening the horizon, broadening the array of small molecules that can immobilize. And this allows you to couple um, thousands of molecules to the surface. And this is an example of an array spotted on our isocyanate, uh, in this case with a, a diamine cadaverin, fluorescently labeled, showing that we can immobilize 10,000 spots easily and quickly on our isocyanate surface. Okay, so I've told you about the libraries, I've told you about the surface chemistry, let's move on to printing. So this is Mercury, this is uh, Arrayjet's latest generation of inkjet liquid handlers. So Mercury for small molecule screening is a ready to use hit detection platform. So it's the world's first commercially available small molecule microarray platform. Whole compound libraries, as I've described, can be immobilized onto functionalized surfaces for screening against your target of interest. It's DMSO compatible. We load the plates that, uh, in 384 well format, as shown in this picture on the right. So Mercury uses uh, inkjet printing. And what do I mean by this? So there's no pins or glass dispensers. That all the printing is happening non-contact. And we do this using uh, an industrial grade print head. It's DMSO compatible, and our print head is able to hold different amounts of samples, 12 or 32, depending on how we'd load them within the nozzle. The print head is already always moving when we're spotting, and we're able to change the spot size and the volume um, deposited while the print head is rapidly moving across the surface. 
and the printhead has a custom coating to avoid any issues with clogging. So there's two parts to the process of printing. There's the printhead, which I've told you a little bit about and how that prints the small molecules onto the surface. And there's also the microfluidic sample transfer. So this is our automated plate to printhead sample transfer. And this is uh, what we call the jet spider because it looks like a spider other than it has 12 or 32 legs. So an unusual spider. And we perform simultaneous aspiration of 12 or 32 samples through the stainless steel capillaries into the printhead is compatible with uh, plate seals on on the on the plates as depicted in the bottom where you can see the jet spider over the plate with the capillaries in the plate aspirating the sample into the print head so it was access deep into the wells to minimize dead volume and i'll just give you a little schematic of how this process works so we decoupled the the kind of aspiration and and the printing into two separate units. So in this example here, the print head on the top is mated with the jet spider. We can see the legs of the jet spider in the small molecule samples, which are coloured. We then aspirate those samples through the capillaries. We load small, very small volumes around one microliter or less into the print head into different nozzles. We then decouple the uh, jet spider and the print head from each other. The jet spider goes and gets washed while the print head prints on the fly. And that's what's depicted on the right here. We're very, very rapidly firing those individual 100 picoliter drops across the surface. We actually image every spot we, we print. And this is particularly important when you're doing screening and you want to um, you know, be confident in the, in the spotting and the printing of these thousands, tens of thousands or, or more uh, molecules. We have twin cameras mounted on our print head and we have an automated process that can automatically correct uh, position. And we can work on a variety of substrates as depicted on the image on the right. And this technology is painted to it. So why are rayjet and small molecule printing? So Hopefully this video on the right is showing, this is, um, this is our print head moving in real time across a, um, across a slide surface and you can see how quick it is. Our technology is the fastest. So we print very, very small droplets. So 100 picoliter drops, when we aspirate these samples into the print head, aspirate less than one microliter, and this is enough to do more than 250 small molecule tests. We're very, very fast, so we can print 100 or even 1,000 of these um, individual chips at a time. We were to print 100 uh, individual chips with 50,000 small molecules uh, on each chip. We can do that in less than three and a half days. And again, this is really critical for maximizing that surface reactivity that I told you about earlier and maximizing the compound binding. Density, we can we print very, very small spots. These spots, we can have more than 50,000 per chip. And throughput is important. So we have uh, a variety of different instruments. We have a manufacturing grade instrument, the 1000, that is able to print a thousand slides in one go. We can print small molecules down onto these chips and then we can bank these slides as long as they're dried and protected from humidity. The compound is covalently coupled to the surface and these are stable for well over a year. And we can pull down on these and perform screening on them. As we've said, library size before, it's very much up to the customer, it's up to you. You know, at the moment we're seeing customers working in the 10 to 100,000 small molecule space seems to be a good number, but there's no real upper limit. And particularly with customers coming to us with these um, natural product libraries, which are very, very, very large, you know, we could be working in the, in the million or more small molecule compounds. And we've got more than 20 years experience, um, you know, developing, using this printing technology across a, across a wide range of applications. You know, I did my first uh, microarray experiment in 2009, and it's something that I've continued throughout my scientific career. Okay, so we're working our way through the process. So I'm now going to move on to uh, talk a little about target type, the binding assay, and the HIT identification process. So I think it's important to say actually small molecule microarraying, you know, is, is there's a wide range of um, different types of biomolecules that have been screened on a small molecule microarray, DNA, protein, RNA. Um, but a RayJet's particular focus at the moment offering screening surfaces is, fo uh, is focused on proteins and RNAs. So I'll start off with proteins as depicted at the top here. Purified proteins, recombinant proteins work very, very well for this. We need low sample volumes. And we can typically work with we typically work with tagged proteins. 
However, I think actually cell lysates is a particular sweet spot for this technique. These can be transient or overexpression systems for your um, protein of interest. And I think a cell lysate is a much more relevant biological system. The proteins will be in complex with um, other proteins. They should be folded correctly and they're more likely to have the correct post-translational modifications. And we don't need to go through any of that, um, that long and inefficient um, purification process that you would typically need. So we need to detect that the protein is bound to the surface and we typically use uh, either antibodies, uh, this or specific tags, um, have an antibody against a specific protein. We maybe would use a HIST tag, which works well in our hands, or some of these two-part tagging systems, which also work well, such as the HALO or the SNAP tag, where we can potentially introduce that tag, the readout fluorescence during the assay or after the initial binding reaction. And that is a very efficient method. Again, as I said, low sample usage, you know, so we're working in the kind of nanomolar to micromolar range of these samples. So if you have precious samples, you know, specific cell lines, um, organoids, things like that, it, it, it's very efficient for screening. So I'm going to move on to talk about RNA, and I've got some more slides talking about RNA in a minute. So we've seen a lot of interest in using small molecule microarray for RNA because it's, it's a well-established field um, in academic literature. We typically work with RNA in the 15 to 200 nucleotide range, and that's really for sort of convenience of synthesis, either synthesizing these yourself or buying them commercially. You know, people work with much longer um, RNAs, long non-coding RNAs can be multiple KBs in length, but we typically break these down into smaller subfragments to work with and make it more easy to screen. RNA folding is critical when we're talking about um, screening small molecules against RNA targets because it's really the RNA's secondary and tertiary structure that is unique to that RNA that we're trying to find a specific small molecule binding interaction for. At the moment, we've actually progressed to favoring a dual color assay, and I think this is another benefit, nice benefit of the small molecule microarray platform. So we can have an internal control, it can be a well-known RNA, or it can be a binding mutant or, or something else, and this can be screened in parallel on, uh, in the, on the same surface as your target of interest. And the RNAs are directly labelled, so we don't need to worry about specific tags or antibodies. We can use conventional fluorophores like Psi2, Psi5, LX4647, because we have very high-resolution sensitive microarray scanners that we use from Anopsis to image these spots. Okay, so that's an overview of the target types. I'm going to share a little bit of um, ArrayJet's data on this because we wanted to you know, validate our own small molecule screening platform by replicating known interactions from the literature. So rapamycin is a very well-known immunosuppressant drug. Um, has a long history. It binds specifically to a family of uh, proteins, immunophilins, known as the FKBPs. And we performed a small molecule assay using a tagged version of one of these known targets, FKBP12, recombinant protein, his tag uh, that bind, that is a known binding partner of rapamycin, and then a very similar molecule to rapamycin, another immunosuppressant called FK506. And these are the two compounds that you can see on the screen here, rapamycin on the left and uh, yes, FK506 on the right. And the data that I want to share with you to show that the sensitivity of our small molecule microarray assay when we immobilize these small molecules on the surface and then we do a binding interaction where we use uh, FKBP12, his tagged, we bind this on the surface, we can see uh, different concentrations of both the small molecules, as you can see along the bottom of these two plots, or different concentrations of the protein, we can say we get good sensitivity. And we now use these um, you know, well-studied small molecule to protein or RNA interactions that I'm going to talk about next as sort of you know, controls in all our small molecule microarray experiments. So I'm going to <clears throat> move the focus a little bit to talk about uh, targeted protein degradation. So there's obviously a variety of ways in which proteins uh, can be targeted with small molecules. There's the more conventional inhibitor-based approach. There's a lot of interest around these molecular glues. But I'm going to talk about this uh, nice process known as targeted protein degradation. So um, targeted protein degradation is um, 
by proteolysis targeted chimeras or protac has the potential to therapeutically target previously undruggable proteins. And I think that's what make it, makes it very exciting. And it actually uses the uh, selective protein degradation using the ubiquitin proteasome system, the cell's endogenous cellular degradation machinery to perform this. So how does this work? So I've put this example here um, of a specific uh, protac drug uh, called ARB110. Uh, it's an androgen receptor binding target uh, that has been in clinical trials that showed good efficacy for certain types of cancer where the androgen receptor is mutated or overexpressed. And I've taken this from a nice review in Nature Drug Discovery on Protax. So I encourage you to have a look at that. So, you know, why is this relevant? So this is a good example of a heterobifunctional molecule. So the molecule consists of two ligands joined by a linker region. And this is what is depicted here. So we've got the, um, in green here, we've got the entry vector, the binding uh, ligand for the protein of interest, in this case, the androgen receptor. We have a linker region in the middle where we join the two together. And then we have the, um, the ligand in blue that binds the E3 ubiquitin ligase and recruits this ligase um, it recruits the uh, ubiquitin ligase from the protein of interest and the degradation by the endogenous cellular machinery. Here's a little schematic here, so we can see the protein of interest, obviously it's not to scale, but to uh, highlight the point that the um, protein of interest is, uh, well then recruit the E3 ubiquitin ligase, which then ubiquitates the, ubiquitinates the uh, in this case, androgen receptor. And why is this important for small molecule microarray? Well, it's challenging actually to identify suitable sites for attaching a, a attachment or exit vector from the from the small molecule to the linker region and to attach your ligase or uh, ligase binding ligands. And you know, I, th I think as I've already covered, small molecule microarray is a surface capture based method. So small molecules are captured on the surface. And therefore, small molecule microarray enriches for binding modalities where we have both an entry vector for the target of interest and an exit vector site for the linker. And this is really important. You know, we're talking about speeding up the viability of compound identification, and it really aids in this rational design of these heterobifunctional molecules. Okay, so I'm going to move on to talk about drugging RNA. So, um, RNA has until recently been thought of as undruggable. Uh, you know, there are a variety of RNA-based therapeutics out there, such as short interference RNAs or antisense oligonucleotides. But actually, we're now starting to see that small molecules can bind to these um, specific RNAs, and they're binding to specific structures within the RNA. So RNA forms a secondary and tertiary structure, and this uh, image on the right here is taken from this nice review, and this is the uh, three prime triple helix of the long non-coding uh, RNA MALACT1, and you can see it forms this very complicated secondary and tertiary structure as depicted here. And we know actually that RNA uh, contains structures that small molecules can bind to, and I'll show you some more evidence of that. And there's a benefit of using small molecules um, over some of these other approaches, um, you know, have good oral delivery, better uh, bioavailability, and other benefits like that. And we are now starting to see some success stories. You know, this is an example here, uh, Ristaplan, which is um, to treat the genetic condition, serious genetic condition, uh, spinal mus muscular atrophy. And this is a very interesting approach, actually, where they're uh, targeting uh, the paralog of the gene that's actually mutated in this condition and trying to upregulate um, uh, a very similar gene that can in part compensate for some of the, the phenotypes seen in spinal muscular atrophy. So again, a very interesting and novel approach. I think that, you know, it's, there's still um, a lot of work to do in this space, you know, what type of RNA is being targeted? Are we targeting pre-mRNA? Are we targeting mature RNA? There's many, many types of RNA in the cell. So I think that will be interesting to see how this develops further. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about uh, riboswitches as a paradigm for understanding these kind of structural RNA units that I'm talking about. So riboswitches, if you're not familiar, are structural RNA elements that occur in untranslated regions of mRNA and bacteria. And this is the schematic on the right here. We can see the full length mRNA of this particular stylized bacteria taken from this nice review highlighted at the bottom here. And we can see the, the riboswitch in the 5' UTR. 
depicted here. And Reiner switches are really interesting as they act as regulators of gene expression through binding of small molecule ligands. So they induce as a conformational change in the RNA structure. And this is what's depicted in the second half of this schematic. So Reiner switches typically have two domains. They have an aptamer binding domain, ligand binding domain, uh, that recognizes a particular ligand, um, often related to or primarily related to functions of that associated gene. It's autoregulatory. And in this schematic here, we have um, we have a ligand binding, in this case plus M, causing the switch in the sequence structure to move into the active domain. And in this example here, we see the expression platform folds into a different structure, in this case, a terminator stem loop, which causes transcription to abort. So I think this is a really interesting process to understand how structural RNAs work and how we might be able to target them. But, you know, why is this relevant? Well, um, we can use this to understand um, better how small molecules can bind to these RNAs. So pre-Q1, uh, ribosome switch controls the expression of genes responsible for the biosynthesis of creatinine, uh, which is a nuclear base, and the ribosome switch regulates downstream gene expression in response to binding of its ligand. And in really a seminal paper by the Schneethoff lab that's referenced here, Conway et al., 2019, they performed a small molecule microarray screen using an isocyanate surface, using small molecules coupled to that surface of um, 26,000 small molecules, and they were able to identify a specific ligand that bounds specifically to um, this same or very similar binding pocket that the cognate ligand highlighted in the top right. So this is pre-Q1 here. You can see the pre-Q1 riboswitch RNA, the stem loop like structure. We can see the pre-Q1 ligand, and then when we see some data here highlighted is uh, where this binds and it changes the RNA structure and then this is the results from their large small molecule microarray screen you can see the individual hits here we can see this compound one was the primary hit identified from that screen and actually we can see really nicely in another figure from that paper that I encourage you to look at see a co-crystal structure of this aptamer complex with the pre-Q1 riboswitch. switch. So you can really see how this small molecule um, compound binds within this particular folded region of the RNA structure. And it's a very, very well studied um, uh, binding interaction. And now we again use this as one of our primary controls when we're running our small molecule microarray screens. So as I said before, you know, we, we want to replicate some of these known, um, known interactions. We want to demonstrate that we've got a robust fluorescence for molecular microarray screen. And um, so that's what I'm going to show here. And also, this is an opportunity to talk a little bit more about the process, which is, you know, is simple in a sense, in the simplicity and, el and elegant in a way that we print these small molecules down on the surface. So we've printed these two small molecules on the right. So we've got the uh, pre-Q1. And we've got the um, we've got the primary hit small molecule one from that screen. You can see that they're printed down here at three different concentrations onto our isocyanate surface using our technology. We then fold up the RNA. This is obviously critical to make sure the RNA is properly folded into its secondary structure. We incubate that with the surface. We gently wash the surface to remove non-specific binding, and then we are able to image and analyze the data. And this is what this plot at the bottom here shows. We can see it across a range of concentrations of both the three, di uh, three different concentrations of the small molecule, 10, 5, and 2.5 millimolar, and the pre-Q1 ligand. We see we get good binding compared fold enrichment to DMSO only across two different RNA concentrations. So again, for us, it's about replicating this work, showing that it, it works in our, in our system and using this as a control for all our assays. Okay, so moving towards the back end of the talk now. So, you know, I'm going to tell you a little bit about actually what a small micro microarray screen might look like. So, in this example here, we've got an array of 15,000 spots onto a slide. This is the grid on the left of these spots um, aligned after imaging and screening. We then we would maybe run a number of different targets. Think about technical uh, replicates on here. We print down the compounds and then we incubate uh, our RNA in this example. With, with the slide surface, we probably have our target of interest and a control. And this is again what I was saying about the benefit of this two color approach. We can have a blue label, which is 408, and a red label in the 635. This is an example of what a screen might look like where we identify specific binding interactions when the target is bound to that small molecule of interest. We then extract the signal intensities of those bound spots. We're able to calculate Z scores uh, and rank the hits and do some statistical analysis on that. So this is how you might 
do a micro, small micro micro screen with a range end. Okay, so I've worked through the process of small molecule microarray now, and I'm just going to finish up by talking about validation. So, you know, a number of customers, when we're working with them on small molecule microarray, ask us, how can we validate the targets? And obviously, there's many methods for this, um, NMR, structural methods, other, other appropriate small molecule binding methods, but we are keen to have something that's complementary to the um, to the small molecule microarray process that we offer. So we've been working with Hariba, and I'm going to show a bit more on that slide, uh, to use surface uh, plasmon resonance. So if you're not familiar with this technique, I'll just cover how this works and how it's beneficial for screening small molecules. And we can use this as a target validation uh, that is complementary to the primary screen. So surface plasmon resonance imaging is a label-free optical detection technique. Uh, and it can be used to monitor and analyze biomolecular interactions in real time. And that's what makes it very powerful. And this is all through changes of the refractory index on the surface of the SPR biochip, which in turn correlates to mass variations and binding events uh, on the surface to the immobilized ligands. So in this example here, we have an array of small molecules printed onto the surface. We then flow using a flow cell through the Hariba system, our specific analyte of interest or target of interest be it a folded RNA or a protein. We measure all these um, interactions in parallel with each spot, and then we observe the surface plasmon wave phenomenon in real time, and we're able to see that binding and, the, uh, and then the disassociation. So Roger is very excited to be working with Hariba and their OpenPlex SPRI system, which is depicted on the right here, uh, to offer and develop a small molecule microarray confirmation and validation screening service. So. As I'm sure you're now aware, a RayJet technology is able to print very, very small amounts of spots onto the surface. So a RayJet can print hundreds of small molecule hits from a primary small molecule microarray screen onto an SPI surface. And this is an image of um, some printing that we were doing earlier in the week, where you can see we're getting nice spots arrayed onto these custom gold surfaces. And then, you know, I think this is a, a unique approach that is complementary to the small molecule microarray hit discovery. I know other methods for uh, doing SPRI talk about binding specific RNAs or proteins to the surface and flowing the small molecules over them. And that does have challenges, particularly when you're working with RNA and you're trying to get it to, to, uh, to maintain its particular structure. In this case, we have the small molecules ligands bound to the surface, and then we flow our target analyte in solution over the surface and look for that binding interactions. And it's a very similar approach to we would use for small molecule microarray screening, but it gives us a lot more information. So we've been developing a proprietary uh, complementary surface chemistry to allow us to do this. And we can now do automatic hip picking from small molecule compound plates that the primary screen was performed in. We then flow those targets over the printed chips and you know this is a label free detection method so you know we don't need to worry about antibodies or tags we can see these binding interactions happen in real time and it provides kinetic and affinity data which i think is really powerful and there's something very satisfying about seeing these interactions happen in real time and then disassociate so this is something that we're working on at the moment we're looking forward to being able to release more information about that soon and we're looking for some early adopters to um, to to work with us on using this as a validation for our current small molecule microarray screening platform. Okay, that's coming to an end now. So I think I've given you hopefully a good introduction into um, small molecule microarray, and I'll just finish off by telling you about some of the benefits uh, for the method. So I think I've said this already, it's a very efficient method. A microarray is essentially a miniaturized experiment. Um, so the nature of small molecule microarrays using very low compound volumes and low target volumes allows large libraries to be rapidly screened against panels of targets and while maintaining low reagent costs. It's very data driven and this is one of the I think key shifts that we're seeing you know companies um, you know, generating large data sets from microarray type experiments and it provides valuable insight into compound interactions. So it enables much more informed decision-making and drug development. And the, we're now seeing customers wanting to use this type of data-driven approach to feed these sophisticated computational models, these machine learning algorithms, these AI-based approaches. They need to be trained on data and to be able to make predictions and these kind of um, data that we can generate using SMM is great for training those data sets. Chemical space. Well, yeah, small molecule microarray can be used to generate 
again, a test large curated libraries of compounds. That's why we're very excited to work with ChemSpace and their wide variety of compounds they have and really explore the vast chemical space uh, and potential binding. I think this is particularly relevant as you know new targets are coming online, this growing interest in targeting RNAs. You know, we have a wide range of small molecules already available. They're already ready to screen. And I think it's about making most of, of those compounds that are available. And I think I've covered this a little bit as well. You know, there is a, a substantial body of literature out there on small molecule microarray. I encourage you to look some of that. And we're really, you know, we're working with and using that technology that has been well established by these academic groups. So the technology is very versatile, it's been applied to various areas of drug discovery, including target identification, lead compound optimization, and studying protein ligand and RNA ligand interactions. And I think, you know, there's a lot more we can do with this technique. I think it'd be very interesting to see how we can use this technique to potentially look at protein-protein interactions. And, you know, Arrayjet is continuing to, to lead the way in small molecule uh, microarraying and similar types of applications. OK, that's my overview. So hopefully you all got a good understanding of the process. And that's it from me. So, yeah, thank you very much for your attention uh, and happy to take any questions. Yeah, thank you, Adam. It was a great presentation. It was really insightful and I would say great scope and wide um, expertise of, of array jets that you cover. And we hope we hope to to have more and more combined clients of ours. Hopefully we have uh, some of those here on the call, uh, on the webinar, sorry. Yeah. So we have a couple of questions, so uh, I think we can okay. start with those. Um, uh, if you don't mind, uh, our, uh, Denise, I will go just like in the, in the accordance, how it were, how it just, uh, we received those. Yeah. So the first question is, uh, what is the range of the volume, uh, volume, uh, that the spider aspiration and the uh, print heads manage. You also mentioned that the spider is washed. Uh, is that uh, is the uh, print heads uh, purged also or washed? Yeah. So what are the range of volumes? So yeah, I think I said as I as I covered a little bit in the talk. So um, the the jet spider is able to aspirate. We, no, we normally say just under a microliter of small molecules into the print head, and then that's available for printing. And we use those you know, hundreds of, of individual 100 picoliter drops for printing. Yes, we wash both parts of it. So again, this is part of the benefit of decoupling the print head and the jet spider. Both parts are washed after the printing is completed with the, um, with the print head. We then purge the print head using the system buffer. We then come back and aspirate again. And we have very, you know, we have very strict kind of uh, washing and um, and cleaning protocols that that really yeah aid that okay yeah it's definitely very necessary to wash those absolutely yeah another question uh how do you deal with the lodging uh, situations of the print head i think i think i think this is a you know small molecules are a very very diverse range of compounds oh, yeah. and you know i think they do to have different behaviors I, you know the concentration the concentration ranges that we're printing we don't tend to see too many problems with with clogging um of small molecules but you know for other more more viscous samples when we aspirate lysates and proteins you know we have specific cleaning routines and specific ways of, of controlling for that potentially by purging and washing more all the types of buffers that we work with but you know we haven't seen major problems with the um with the small molecule microarray a, a approach and i think it's partly down to the speed you know we're printing very very quickly we're ejecting all those droplets and then we're, we're flushing the system and we're coming back again. So it's not spending very long inside the print head. And as I said, the print head has this custom coating, which really minimizes any sort of um, binding within the print head. Gotcha. Yeah. Thank you for the answer. Thank you for the question, actually. I forgot to mention that one. Uh, how did you, how did the back, uh, background levels look with cell? Uh, lysate uh, printing. Uh, yeah. What kind of troubleshooting you would need with that? Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a good question. And I think this sort of plays into our expertise across a 
wide range of microarray uh, fields. You know, I think the nice thing about the isocyanate surface particularly is we, we make it with peak reactivity, we couple the compounds, and then we, we block and quench the surface very, very um, specifically to make to minimize binding to that surface. So um, yeah, we, we quench all the isocyanate uh, residues on the surface, and then we have a variety of blocks, typical blocking processes that other you know, other applications would use, like BSA. And um, yeah, you know, we, there is some level of background, but you know, I think it's one of the things that we um, that we're able to tune out, particularly um, you know, with lock, with larger and you know, sort of bigger panels of block, uh, different types of blocking processes, BSA, other types of block. And actually, I think the cell lysates, you know, they almost block the surface themselves. Um, so yeah, we do see good signal to noise, but it is definitely a consideration, and it is something that you know may need some optimization with particular types of cell lines or particular expression levels of the target. Good question. <laughs> good answer. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, do you control the density of small molecules on a surface to ensure they all have the same density in every spot? Which equipment do you use to measure the interaction? Yeah, I think that's a, yeah, I think that's an interesting question. You know, I think this is where you know it is a primary screening method, and you know, I think not all small molecules will be coupled identically to the surface. You know, we work in in specific concentration ranges, which we know work well. But I think there will be some variation between that. And I think that's just inherent in the variability of small molecules that we're working with. You know, I think if we were to focus in on specific ones, we could maybe optimize that and look, and look at how they bind. And I think that's maybe where the SPRI comes in. Or, you know, if you're going to go and do a focused experiment on a smaller panel of, of small molecules, you can do big, you know, big dilution ranges and try and identify those specific features. So it's not something we do for a big screen because it's it you know, it's potentially not appropriate at that scale. But yeah, I understand the point that there will be some variation. You know, we're just looking for those kind of initial binary, is it binding or not interactions? And then we can zoom in using SPRI or other methods to kind of characterize that further. But yeah, again, another good question. Another good answer. Yeah, uh, another question we have. Uh, have you tried the slides from different companies? Um, so as I said, there isn't actually any commercially available isocyanate slides. You know, we we have done small molecule microarraying on uh, epoxy surfaces, which which does work. You need to you know pick your small molecules and your nucleophilic residues um, more carefully when you're coupling to epoxy. But you know, I think this is why I presented that data. You know, the isocyanate really is the most reactive surface that you can print on. It does make it challenging to work with. It has a specific time window. So yeah, you can do it on a commercially available epoxy surface. But you know, isocyanate really is the gold standard for maximizing binding. So that's why we yeah we use that for our platform. Understood. Yeah, kind of. We have another mm, interesting question. Uh, probably it's going to be in uh, the last one uh, or something. Uh, um, what uh, what if, what is the future of uh, SMM? The future. Of SMM. Um, yeah, I think I think it's a it's a good question. I think um, ma making the most of other types of detection techniques. So obviously we're using fluorescence um, at the moment for our assays. I think that's why we're excited to use this label free method with the SPRI because I think that you know removes some of the challenges of working with tags and antibodies so I think that has a specific um, you know what one direction that I think is very exciting I think um, another area I think of, of you know of what is the future of small molecule microarray? I think potentially working in protein protein interactions you know potentially multi-stage process of coupling small molecules you know, we have a we have a a, um, a particular method at Array Check called Arrayplex, where we actually print multiple rounds of compounds and, and targets on a slide. And I think um, 
you know, looking at protein protein interactions, how we can break protein protein interactions, I think would be very powerful, a bit more challenging. So I think that's, that's, you know, one particular direction that, um, you know, we're actively pursuing. And I think, I think scale is, a, is another one, you know, we can always increase the scale of this, and it's about making it useful for customers. So I think that's, again, why working with ChemSpace on having a wider variety of compounds, potentially having, you know, readily printed uh, arrays would be very powerful. And it's about making it accessible, because, you know, it's a well-established technique, but it's it's the, this is the first commercially available version of that, and we want to make it available for everyone to use, you know, for drug discovery, but also for you know more core academic research. So yeah, the last but not least uh, question. I think we have another uh, to say. Does the amount of, uh, for example, polarization uh, influence the interaction to the target, the orientation of the small molecules? Does the so does the immobilization? Yes, I think I think so, and I think that's why you know we're seeing a lot of interest. Hello? That's Hello? why I highlighted the, the ProTac. Um, you know, Am I back? Yeah. orientation small molecule is is really important, and you know we're not going to get all binding modalities with a, an orientated small molecule bound to a surface. But um, yeah, it, it, it is critical, and that's why the linker length and things like that are are important on the surface as well. How the small molecule is presented. Uh, and how it's able to interact with its target, and I think that's why SMM maybe uh, is is being used uh, you know, to co in complementation with and other methods like Alice Mass Spec, which are kind of solution based. I think those two approaches can can really complement each other. But yes, orientation is important. I think that might be all the questions that we've got, and I think we might have just lost. Oh, you're back. Yeah. Great. I think that would be all questions for today. So I, I would, yeah, apologies for the internet once again. Yeah, uh, but in any case, uh, you, you're all very, uh, very welcome to drop us a line with the questions uh, online via LinkedIn or email. So please, uh, please do it. And uh, as, I, as I mentioned in, this, in the beginning of the webinar, uh, the recording would be tomorrow. And uh, all, all you guys will be will receive the email with the with the recording. So 